I do some consulting work on the American feeling Indonesia. in the room was You don't ever say to her that her point about the Chicago incident. Chicago incident. The United Nations great discussion on the ethical we left. Left. more of a community We're trying to back over. doing in autism. Farnoosh Tarabi is an award-winning personal finance expert, TV personality, and best-selling author whose advice the New York Times has called perfectly practical. A Schreier Honors Scholar, Tarabi graduated from Penn State Smeal College of Business with a degree in finance and international business. She has coached everyone from college students to executives at Fortune 100 firms on how to take control of their finances in order to lead happier lives. We'll talk with her about her money philosophy, about having it all but not doing it all, and about what it means when she makes more than him. Here's our conversation with Farnoosh Tarabi. Farnoosh Tarabi, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. You're a personal finance journalist, the author of about a dozen books, a TV personality, a mother, and in fact, you wear so many hats and have so many irons in the fire that if you had a business card, which you say you don't carry, you wouldn't even know what to put on it. <laughs> it's, one of, it's, it's a good problem to have, I suppose. I don't have a catchphrase or a business card. Um, really, I just think of myself as an opportunist, someone who's passionate about personal finance, who finds opportunities to teach people in a variety of ways about money and financial freedom, like you mentioned, books and now a podcast. So I'm just, uh, I guess I'm just a, a financial nerd. Uh, maybe that's what would go on the, on the business card, but it's a good problem to have, I guess. Now, you got your undergraduate degree in finance and international business at Penn State and then a, a master's in journalism from Columbia University. And your, your first job was at Money Magazine. Mm -hmm. You started as an intern, which sort of is, is proof that that out of the classroom experience is so critical, especially I would think for women in what's traditionally a, a male dominated field, finance. Right. Your experience is everything. And I actually was attracted to becoming a finance major at Penn State because I didn't see a lot of women going for that degree. And I thought, okay, here is maybe another opportunity to be someone in an environment where I'm able to stand out just based on my gender. And there at the time was a lot of support around women pursuing those paths. So uh, the internship at Money Magazine was very advantageous for me. I started there in college, junior year, went to graduate school, then ended up there again as sort of a glorified intern now, making a nice, well, I wouldn't even say nice, making a salary, $18 an hour before taxes. <laughs> but it was a great opportunity to, again, be in New York City, working alongside some pros and learning the biz. So your, your books, uh, they focus on, on helping people uh, get financially healthy, self-help books for mm -hmm. financial health. And the New York Times called uh, your advice perfectly practical. Uh, what is your money philosophy and what influenced it? I know you, you grew up in a, in a household where dad worked and mom was a stay-at-home uh, mother. What influence did all of that have on yeah. the way you look at money? I really think that growing up, not just with a working father and a stay-at-home mom, but with immigrant parents, I think that's where the influence came, where they came to this country with very little, with an emphasis on education, an emphasis on hard work, and were able to really build a wonderful, fulfilling life for themselves and their family. And I think that their legacy to us and me and my brother now are, are uh, adults, I think it's we feel an, um, a need to sort of pay homage to our parents you know that they that, that they you know that we learned from you that we now know what matters and they you know we learn so much from them I almost feel a responsibility to continue to live on that legacy that they've created to go out there and make turn something from nothing you know I again w walked into this world um, not with a lot of resources, I didn't know people, but I was able to strategize and find opportunities and put myself out there and take risks. And I think that um, with regards to your finances, I think uh, I have a similar philosophy, which is that you have to take ownership of your financial life. No one's gonna hand you a rich life. No one's gonna hand you the job. No one's gonna hand you opportunities. You have to really go out there, be your biggest advocate. And yet, if you look at statistics, Half of uh, Americans, 18 to 24, are still living at home. And if you look among college graduates, one in five under age 35 is still living right. at home. The boomerang generation. Uh, yeah, So, or, or some call them kippers. So I'm wondering, 
To what extent would you blame parents for that, or, or is it the economy or a combination of the two? It's a combination. I think parents, you know, the challenge and the opportunity is that you do have a lot of influence over your kids when it comes to their financial wherewithal and also their financial preparedness. And I do think that there is a lot of blame uh, on parents who, you know, really over nurtured their kids. They over provided to the point where the kids don't really feel a need to go out there and be independent. Uh, they know mom and dad will always Life be. Life at home is not so it's bad. It's comfy. But, you know, I always say the moment you become an adult is when you stop blaming your parents <laughs> for everything and you start to take ownership and accountability for your choices now. When I graduated from Penn State in 2002, I remember distinctly being in the car. We were going up Atherton. I think I was still in my cap and gown. And I was thinking in my head, like down the road oh someday I'm gonna be this and someday I can't wait for that and I thought someday is now you know when is that why not now you know I've got the degree I've gotten the education I'm able-bodied I should be able to start making my life happen for myself now and I think that that needs to be the message we need to empower this generation and say you can do this without your parents and if you are living with your parents try to create a situation for yourself where you can look back on that and say that was a real invest good investment of my time so if you're living with your parents and working try to save the money that you would have otherwise paid towards rent and if you're a parent maybe it's that you take some rent from your child you know like try to make it a win-win for everybody so that there's some good lessons learned and that it's you're making the most of your time. Well, here's something that, that I found really surprising. Uh, a, a recent survey of young people found that of three uh, important things to financial health, one, paying debt on time, two, uh, creating a budget and living within your means, and then the third being saving for retirement, less than half did one of those. Oh, my gosh. And only 2% did all three of them. What were they doing? <laughs> I'd like to know what they were actually doing. So it's, it, you know, it, it, at this point, nothing surprises me. I think that it's true, especially with retirement. That's a, that's a part of the, the, the education that just goes amiss because it does feel like it's so far down the road. It's so intangible. Even adults, like working adults in their 40s, aren't doing as much as they can to save for retirement. A lot of that has to do with feeling trapped in their situations, they're paying for college, they're paying for their day-to-day -day retirement, they think they, that can wait. But I think, um, yeah, it's, it really, this speaks to the lack of financial literacy and more than literacy, lack of financial action and empowerment and advocacy that we need in this country. So it's interesting because colleges and universities are now requiring uh, uh, financial literacy courses for incoming freshmen. But what are the biggest financial uh, mistakes that most of us make? I would say first, it's not even a financial mistake, but it has a lot to do with how you spend and how you save, is really figuring out your goals. You know, you graduate from school and you hit the ground running, you start working at a job, you don't even know if you like it, but you're doing it because you know that's what you have to do to make ends meet, and then later you're, you're getting married and then you buy a house. Never along the way have you actually stopped to say, what are my values? What do I want out of life? What makes me happy? What makes me fulfilled? Um, because often that is what leads to uh, financial ruin as we start spending money in ways that doesn't make sense to us. We, we subscribe to things. We sign up for things. We, we buy things we don't want. We're not saving in the way that matters. We're not taking a step back and going, okay, where do I want to be in a year or two? What's important to me? And if you're in a partnership, what's important to us? And then making sure that how you're spending your money and how you're saving and what's coming in is in line with those very basic things. And yeah. Yeah, experts say if you're not saving five, even 10% for retirement, you're not going to have the retirement that you want. I think so. Um, but you often say cash is king. Mm -hmm. What's the problem with having, you know, we need credit cards. Right. But, but, but what's the... Uh, what's the trap that so many of us fall into when we're purchasing what we want with a credit card? Spending with a credit card is really easy. It's really easy. You s now you have to dip your card before where you're swiping. I think that you know studies even show that when you use cash, there is more pain associated with that because the harder to part with. Harder to part with. You actually have to see the the money leave your wallet, and there's a moment where you're stopping to think about, okay, is this meaningful? Is this right? Do I have the money? Whereas with uh, credit cards, it's a lot easier to spend. And um, credit experts uh, who work with families to help them with their credit and their debt find that when they put them on a cash-only budget for a year, 
they are able to save 20 percent of their income on top of whatever else they're they're saving so it is powerful to be able to use cash and I particularly I reserve that cash is king philosophies for especially for people who need to get out of debt if you need to get out of debt you have to put the credit cards aside because you just that, that cycle can only will only continue but to get yourself used to cash that really creates a better relationship with money you really start to understand how you're spending, and then you'll inevitably, I think, make more thoughtful decisions. You were actually the, the host and the financial coach on a, a SoapNet TV, reality TV series called Bank of Mom and Dad, in which uh, three young women between 20 and 30 uh, had to live with mom and dad for a week and get their financial houses in order. And you had a, a detonator, which was really <laughs> a, a glorified paper shredder right. where, where people could shred that credit card and even the uh, takeout menu and uh, passports, yeah. those sorts of things. Tell us a little bit about what you learned working with these women. And I have to say, part of me was a little astonished at how irresponsible the people on the show were. Yeah, and the parents, you know, um, going back, it's, it, it really takes a village to sometimes raise a financially savvy child. And, and starting with family, I think that what was what was so profound through that experience, not only that these children, these adult children, I should say, needed a wake-up call, a financial wake-up call, but the parents were really, I call them the enablers. You know, they were enabling them to feel as if they could have it all and not not have any responsibility or accountability and um, I think that they had raised adult children who were still more children than adult and that it was really hard for the parents are really emotionally attached you know being able to they provide want their kids to be happy they want them to be happy and I said you know what um, you're really enabling them to have an unhappy life in the end because what's going to happen is they're never going to be able to get on their own two feet you're going to someday need some help with your finances because all you've been doing is shoveling money over to What about your own your retirement? Kid. You've done nothing for yourself, so this is going to come back to haunt you in a really bad way. And so, but if you can kind of put the brakes on this now, it's going to be tough love, it's going to be a hard dose of medicine, but there is, there is life after this, and it's a, it's a better life. Your newest book is When She Makes More. First of all, I want to know what percentage of women actually make more than their partners today? One in four. One in four married women in, in a male-female relationship making more than their spouses. That's up, I believe, uh, four times. It's four times bigger than what it was during the Mad Men era. So we've come a long way, but we still have, and in fact, overall, 40% of women are the primary breadwinners in their households. That includes single moms as well. So it is a trend that I see continuing. Well, what do you think is, is fueling it? Because at the same time, you also see that there are more women getting uh, undergraduate and graduate yeah. degrees than men. That has a lot to do with it. So we have women that are over earning because they're over more educated than men. We have more women, like you said, going to graduate school and undergrad. Also, the economy is, I think, shifting in favor of women in terms of the types of job availability. So if you look at the sectors that are going to be booming in the next four or five years, healthcare, services, traditionally education, women, traditionally female-led yeah. industries. And then, of course, we're still making up for what was the man session. So the re Great Recession of 2009, 2008, uh, we saw more male job, more male dominant industries shed jobs like finance, construction, manufacturing. And some of those men have been uh, unable to uh, fill those jobs, get back into the workforce as they were. In the meantime, their wives took over as as breadwinners, and they still are. So what are the, you know, when, when the woman has the higher breadwinning status, uh, some people are afraid that, number one, that will cause societal problems. Number two, that it will chase men away. So what's the reality yeah. on the ground? I don't think, I think it's great for society. I think that there are complexities when you're in a relationship as a female breadwinner. Uh, as I gave in my talk earlier today at Penn State, it's, it's really, for men who, who perceive their role in a marriage as being the provider with a capital P, and often that means being the financial provider, if that's taken away from them, and not, I don't want to say taken away from them, but if that's not the reality because of circumstances, because your wife's making more, um, they can feel a little lost at sea. Like, what's my purpose? What's my role? And communication can break down. And money's already a tough topic in a, in a relationship. As a country, we, have a, we struggle with this taboo issue. So you add to it this layer of 
uh, kind of um, new territory. You know, for years, for generations, for eras, men were predominantly the breadwinners, and now that's shifting. No one's really having the conversation about what that means for ego and role and purpose and um, how to provide in a relationship. And so for families, you can see where there's communication breakdown, um, there's imbalance. As a society, though, I think that we need to... Uh, congratulate women who are making more and support them and but it has to we have to also we can't sell them a false bill of goods you know say hey ladies you can go out there and be successful do whatever you want make a ton of money marry for love and you'll live happily ever after no because no one's really talking about that part of the equation which is like the marriage part you know the relationship part it takes a lot of work and it's kind of unique work I think when she makes more so that's where the book comes in what is the kind of you know the advice for those marriages. Well, well, two things. One, you must have struck a nerve because <laughs> I, I, I brought up on the uh, internet an article about your book and I printed it, walked away, came back and found in the printer a stack of paper this big. It was out of ink. <laughs> it was yeah. out of ink, out of paper because that many people were commenting mm -hmm. on what it means in their own relationships when, when she makes more. What are some of the challenges, because you're part of this 25% yeah. um, in making it work, in, in, in creating a relationship with harmony? Well, I think first, uh, one of the potential uh, issues is that, you know, women aren't prepared to be breadwinners in relationships and men aren't prepared to be supported in that way necessarily in a relationship. So in terms of our psychology preparedness, we, we expect differently when we enter a marriage. I mean, no matter how successful you are as a woman, there may actually be a part of you still that feels like you want to be taken care of in a marriage. Okay, I'm just going to say it. And that's what I hear from a lot of my female interviews that they did never expect it to be the one making more, and nevertheless, that here they are doing it. Um, no one wants are, to talk to them about it. Is there there's... is resentment a little bit. There's also a lot of um, confusion. They don't really know. Okay, well, if I'm out there making the big paycheck, I come home. Am I still expected to cook and clean and this and that and be at the forefront of everything else? And the reality is, is that most of them still are. Yeah, and you know what? A lot of them want to be at the forefront. You know, this isn't to say that women who make more don't want to be home and, and supporting their family in other ways. Um, so how do you reconcile that? Because there's only so many hours in the day, right? And there's only so much energy to go around. So that's really one of the biggest issues is how do you protect and maintain your role as a breadwinner in society as a female at your job? And how do you come home then and still be at the forefront of these other things that you want to be doing um, in a way that you feel is appropriate, you know, and that is satisfying that you're not doing it all without support. Well, one of the things uh, you said is that uh, having it all is, but you have having it all, but not doing it right. all. When she makes more, this isn't my study. I, I did look at a, a thousand women across the country and, and extracted from them lots of interesting nuggets, but there are a lot, there's a lot of other data out there about women who make more and their habits. One of them we found is that when she makes more, she does more housework. You know, and psychologically speaking, I guess it makes Maybe sense. Maybe she's an A personality, and perhaps so. Yes, she wants it to be a certain way at work and a certain way at that home. That is and in order definitely to get it that way. She does it. Yes, definitely part of it. Another reason is also uh, the psychologists think, the behavioral and gender experts think, is that she's trying to overcompensate for her what is perceived to be a very masculine role in now in the marriage as the breadwinner. So she's making up for it in the housewifery department and overextending herself and doing things that she doesn't really even want to be doing, but doing it because she feels as a woman it's what she has to okay, do. Okay, well you do something that surprises me. You say in your book that when you and your husband go out to dinner, yes. you allow him, he pulls out the credit card, yeah. which you pay in full at the end of the month. Why do you feel the need to yeah. do that? And do you think we might be changing the way society mm -hmm. views that if you just pulled out the credit card and paid it, since ultimately in the end, right. that's what one does of the it things matter? you do pay. What, what does, does, it, does matter? it matter? But you know what? We're in a relationship. And in a relationship, there are certain ways of doing things that make you feel feminine. And masculine and I think that in our relationship that's what we have identified as being one way to sort of for me to step into my feminine and for my husband to step into his masculine we're not hurting anyone uh, we, we both know perfectly well who's paying that bill at the end of the at the end of the month but in that moment it allows us to sort of play this dance and be a little um, maybe chivalrous 
maybe call it romance, call it whatever you want. In our relationship, it works. Some people would look at that and go, oh my God, you're, 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 you're bowing to patriarchy by letting your man pay the bill. You know what? In a relationship, as I said in, the, in our talk, it's not about political correctness. Um, it's not about... It's um, what it feels right for you. It feels you. what feels right to you. And as long as you're in a partnership where that's supported and respected, then great. Do what, you, do what you have to do. You also recommend three buckets of money, yours, his, and ours. And, and the part that I find most interesting is that 10 to 15 percent of the gross income is his to do with it as he pleases. <laughs> 15 to 20 percent, if she's the biggest uh, breadwinner, uh, is for her to do as she pleases. Which, if you do the math, 15 to 20 percent on a on a hundred thousand is a lot quite, of money. Quite a yeah. lot more than 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 the fifty thousand right. dollar salary or twenty five thousand dollar salary. So, how did you come up with that? I, I guess what I was thinking is, you know, if you're paying taxes, the person with the bigger tax. Uh, with the bigger income is paying a higher tax rate than the person with the lower tax rate. Right. So why why did the three yeah. buckets and why does she get more? There's not a lot of science behind that. I think really my rationale was at the end of the day, um, if she's paying for a lot of the household expenses because she is the breadwinner, then she deserves to be rewarded you know, with her own money, a little bit more every month. Why not? Describe or, or define for us, if you would, financial freedom because that's really what you're trying to help Americans achieve whether they make two hundred and fifty thousand right. dollars a year or if like the median income in the US they're making fifty one thousand dollars a year. Yeah, That's a really good question because there's financial freedom, there's financial independence, there's financial uh, liter you know, liberation, you know, I guess at the end of the day for me what I'm ultimately trying to teach people through my books and my talks and what, how I would define financial freedom is living your life in alignment with your goals in a way that you can afford it. You know, you can afford the life that is that that brings you fulfillment, and that you can go to sleep at night and not have to worry about money. That you can wake up in the morning and look forward to going to work. That you can look forward to providing for your family. That you're not stressed out. Um, that you're making your money work for you ultimately. And Again, the beauty in that is that it's different for everybody. You know, there are certain things you have to take care of. Obviously, you're dead. You have to save. You have to make money. Uh, but beyond that, it's really about allocation and management and um, putting your money where it makes sense to you. And that's what ultimately is going to define your freedom. One of your books, one of your almost dozen books, is on embracing your entrepreneurial spirit. And I think what's so interesting about people living today is that there are, because of technology, so many different ways yeah. of making money. You can rent out a room on Airbnb if you want or become a driver for Uber. Talk a little bit, if you would, about this entrepreneurial spirit. If you aren't happy with where you are financially, right. there are some things you can do um, to get there. Absolutely. I think uh, not to disregard the income problem that we have in this country. Absolutely. I think that uh, we know incomes have been stagnant, especially college grads now. If you look at salaries, starting salaries, they're not that much higher than what they were when I was leaving college 10, 12 years ago. Yet everything's gone up in price. So I, I, I recognize and I, um, I empathize with everybody who says, you know, I'm just not making enough. So in that case, you've identified the problem. You have an income problem. What can you do? The good news is, is that we are living in a time and an era where with the internet, there's so much accessibility to either monetize a skill, monetize your home, monetize assets. Make a money stream out of something Make that you a money, enjoy. Yeah, I mean, just being on campus, I think relevant to a lot of people, tutor.com is a great website where you can go on and teach virtually. You have students of all ages, um, depending on what your skill set is, if it's Spanish fluency, if it's mathematics, if it's science. Math and science tutors do get the most, so if that's your niche, you're good. Um, but there are a lot of ways, as you say, to monetize yourself, renting a room through Airbnb, uh, RelayRides.com, you can rent your vehicle when you're not using it and it comes with insurance. You can um, rent even your assets if you've got, I don't know, an, a spare laptop or some drills or some power tools in your garage. You can rent those to neighbors. So you don't have to actually part with anything. You're just getting money for things when you're not using them. And everyone in them. the neighborhood doesn't need a lawnmower. Exactly. So you're saving, you're conserving, them. <laughs> you're leaving a smaller carbon footprint and making a little bit of money. So how do you reconcile all of this with the fact that okay, we've got 25% of American women today earning more than their husbands. And on the flip side, 
we've still got the majority of women earning 77 cents on the dollar right. of every white male doing the same job, 64 cents if you're a, uh, an African-American woman, and 54 cents if you're a Latina. It's devastating, and I, you know, we have made some improvements. I think the, di if anything, the dialogue around this has definitely heated up, and I feel as though I'm reading more about this, and we have more leadership popping up around this dialogue and this movement. Um, it's a co what I talk about in the book is completely different than what's happening in the in society at large. I think that to ultimately ar arrive at a day where there is income parity. You need a lot of things to happen. You need women to start negotiating more for their worth. So we don't see as many women, for example, when they graduate from college and going into the first job, they're not negotiating their salaries as much as men. You just gotta ask, ask for more money. Assume you're not getting paid as much and ask for more. Uh, of course, do your homework, do your research. Don't just ask to ask, but really know your worth and you're worth a lot more than you think. Farnoosh Tarobi, thank you so much for talking with us. My pleasure, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Farnoosh Tarabi. For more of her financial advice, visit our website at conversations.psu.edu. I'm Patty Satalia. We hope you'll join us for our next Conversation from Penn State. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you.